I almost didn't preach this series of sermons this week. Things happened this week that was the opposite of this sermon. Then we had the funeral, and I'm feeling like it would be heartless, heartless to stand up here on a Sunday after the week we've had and knowing the text I've had with different people and, and the situations that I've had to deal with and the funeral, and I'm going to get up in front of a church knowing what the people in the church are going through, and I'm going to tell them that we're going to feel our joy juice jar when I know many of the people that are coming here this morning have their jar empty. And they're standing here, and they're coming in here empty. They don't feel joy. But I have it scheduled, so I'm going to do it. And I felt uneasy about it. And, and the longer I kept doing it, I said, well, see, that's the problem, Nate. You're going at joy as a feeling. Biblical joy is not a feeling. You're wanting happiness. And see, happiness is an outcome. And we all want to be happy, and that's, that's one thing that we all strive for is happiness, and we want our family to be happy, and, and some of you are getting ready for Thanksgiving, and, and let me ask you this, how many of you are a little nervous about everybody being happy at Thanksgiving? Who here, did some of you are, oh, I don't know. Uh, how about this, how many of you already called certain people and told them no politics at Thanksgiving? How many, so, some of you, have, no, no politics Thanksgiving this year. Uh, how many of you told you already no talking football at Thanksgiving this year? Have you got that? Some of you have got K-State fans and KU fans. Brad Cox, how did you let him marry a K-State lady? Just shake your head and move on. All right, all right. But K-State won, by the way. Moving on. Um, but you ever notice joy? Max Lucado, in one of his books, said that this best describes our society. He goes on by saying this, the symbol of our society is the exercise bike. It represents what we most have, excess weight. It also represents what we most want, to be different. It represents what most people spend most of their time doing, pedaling furiously and getting nowhere. High activity with low achievement. Carpools, diapers, bills, time clocks. You can go on getting your kids to this practice, getting your kids over here, running over to this, trying to do this, this meeting, that meeting. We're just busy, 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 and it seems like we keep spinning our wheels and nothing's getting accomplished and nothing's getting done. Does it sound like anybody's life yet? Office walls painted with grayness of routine. Houses framed with wooden humdrum. For many, life is lived on the exercise bike. Day after day, the same seat, doing the same thing, and seeing the same scenery. Is there any end to this tunnel of grayness? We're wanting something in our lives, and we're chasing after something. We just don't know what it is. And part of the problem is we're looking at life wanting happiness, but we're not plugging in joy first. Now, there's different types of joy, and the joy that I'm talking about is a spiritual gift. When you become a Christian, you receive the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And one of the aspects of that fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy, and the Old Testament calls this joy the joy of the Lord. And it's not an emotion. It's an assurance, an assurance. John Piper said this, joy is Christian joy, is more than just a good feeling, it's a good feeling down deep in the soul. It is produced only by the live and active living of the Holy Spirit, and it is, causes us to see the beauty of Christ in his word and in the world. In all the chaos, in all the mess of this world, this joy, we can still see Jesus in all of it. Can you see Jesus when you turn on the news? Can you still see Jesus working things out? That is the joy. And people say, well, 
But joy is something that's really not talked about much. And in the Bible, the word joy appears 242 times. And of that, 174 times is found in the Old Testament. People talked about this mean God of the Old Testament, and he is the God of the Old Testament who produces and talks about joy. The word rejoice is found 154 times. In the book of Psalms, it says, shout with joy to the Lord. When was the last time you did that? Now, I heard many of you shouting Friday night. Some of you were shouting at people, which I don't think that was joy. But when was the last time you shouted for joy to Jesus? You shouted to joy to the Lord, and you didn't care what other people thought. The word rejoice is found 31 times in the New Testament. The word joy and rejoice in its time set is found 16 times in the book of Philippians. Philippians can be seen as an epistle of joy. The word epistle means letter. Paul wrote this letter while in prison. Here's a side note for you. It was written in probably about 63 or 64 BC. And he was beheaded in 68. Five years left to live. He knows what's coming. And he writes a book of joy. In the first chapter alone, I could write 20 sermons. And in about another 15 minutes, I'm going to try to get you all of the book of John chapter, Philippians chapter 1. And there's so much in this one chapter. It's also a a letter of excellent things, talking about look on what's excellent. It's also the idea of being right-minded. How many teachers or uh, how many school people do we have here? You deal with school. All right. How many of you would just like for your students to get their minds right? You know what I mean? All right, the book of Philippians talks about getting set your responsibility to set your mind right in Jesus. It's also the idea of unity. You want a team to win. You want want your, your class to get together. You want anything to get done right. They've got to work together for a common goal. The church is no different. You want the church to succeed. You want to have a good church. We've got to be working with a common goal. That's the idea of joy. And when I was looking through... Philippians, trying to figure out what is the main thing of the book of Philippians. I found out the key verse is Philippians 1.21. For for me to live is Christ and to die is great gain. When I was in St. Louis Christian College, my professor, first year, set us down. He said, all right, take out a sheet of paper, and I want you to write down your priorities. So I want you, real quickly, just in your head... To, to just in your head, I want you to set down what your priorities are. Now, since you're in church, I know you're going to start with Jesus because that's who you are and, and you're good church-going folk and all that. And then, you, you know, write your priorities. And we started doing that. And, of course, we did Jesus and then family and then school because he was our professor. And we want to get in trouble. So, you know, school is right there. We went through our list and we're trying to write down everything. And, and he said, your list is wrong. And so we're looking at it and so we're, you know, and he said, your list is still wrong. And he said, your list only needs one word. And if you add anything else to that list, it's wrong. And if you want joy in your life, and if you want a life of purpose, you've got to live a life of cause. What is your cause to live? What is your cause to get up in the morning? What is your cause to go to work? If your cause to get up in the morning and go to work is to pay bills, you're short-sighted. If your cause is to get up and go to school tomorrow morning, I just, I got to get up and go to school. Man, you're going to get up grumpy. You're going to get up lousy. If your cause, I just, man, I want the new car. I want the new house. If that's your purpose in life, you're going to have a lousy life. And if you want to set up your goals and and what's important in your life, you just need one word. And life is so much simpler if you just live with one word as your goal. And that one word is Jesus. Jesus in my marriage. 
My goal is to live for Jesus in my marriage. My goal is to live as Jesus as a father. I want my boys to see Jesus in my life. My goal as a minister is for the church to see Jesus in my life. My goal as when I volunteer for something out in community is people to see Jesus in my life. Whenever I'm sitting down at the football field, and that's why I put in more gum in my pocket. My wife started, you buy gum and shut up, Nate, because you got to represent Jesus. And I'm sitting there and I, I see some bad calls. Hey! And she's like... And I got to put more gum in my mouth. So uh, I ran out of gum a couple times. I had to eat some beer rocks. But hey, whatever works, just keep your mouth shut. That's what, you know, people might want to come to church, Nate. Eat some gum. So the focus has got to be Jesus. What's your cause? What's your cause this morning? What is your cause? The focus of godly joy is Jesus at the core of everything in my life. Everything. Philippians 4.13 makes more sense when you realize that my cause is for me to live as Christ. Then I know that I can do all things through him and gives me strength. Because my cause is for him. So this morning we're going to go into this a little more in detail. And Philippians 1.4 says this, In all my prayers for you I pray with great joy. And here's why. Being confident of this one fact, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's talking to the church, those who made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He says, I am confident, I know for well of this one thing, that the God who started something in you is going to see it through to the end. God has an interest in your life. Now mull that over. No one else may care, but God cares about your future. God cares about you, where you're at here and now. And you look through everyone throughout history that God has used. Do a character study of the Bible. Every one of them was a failure. I, I looked at Patrick today and I was like, would you quit stealing my sermon? He said, did I really? I'm like, yeah, my sermon is almost identical to his communion meditation. God used failures in the Bible. People who you wouldn't pick. Would you pick Moses to lead the people out of Egypt? But God was training him for that very purpose from birth. Now when Moses was a little child and his life was all screwed up, do you really think that he was saying, oh, God's preparing me for something greater? That was the last thing on his mind. But that's what he was going through was a training time to prepare him for something greater. You study any person, you see throughout their lives glimpses of God preparing them for a plan that he had set up for something else. Each phase of their lives was preparing them for the next phase. You're probably right now in a planning time. Don't lose your joy. Don't get discouraged. This is a time where God is honing you and, and making you and forming you into something that he can use later. Be, go through your time of planning. Every Christian has a unique position in God's plan. Every one of you has a purpose. I know that God's going to finish what he started. Revelation, John says this, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. But you've got to let him in. You want joy in your life, you've got to be the one to say, Lord, here I am. <laughs> all of me, all the bumps, the bruises, the pimples, the scars, everything about me, here I am. Use me. I'm not much. But you want joy, you just elevated your joy to another cause, you have another level, and your cause is just and right. And John 15 gives us the idea of what true joy is, is when we realize and understand that we're tied to the vine. And Jesus is not going to let us go. Jesus' joy is an income that we put into the situation. Happiness may be the outcome, but Jesus' joy is an income. So the first thing I want us to see is that sharing the gospel builds joy. Joy is something you build up. Joy is something that you work for and you work in. It's something that you put deep down inside of us. Another person said that joy is the igniter of what motivates you, of what gets you going. 
I was watching some football film, and it, does anybody ever remember Youngblood? Played back in 1979. Some of you remember him. Do you realize that he played the last three games of 1979 on a broken leg? Broke his leg. He said, wrap it up. I'm going back in. I'm going to finish this game. Then he went ahead and played two more games on a broken leg. He was not going to quit because he had a purpose in his life. They asked him what he thought about people not playing with turf toe. And he says, I, I just can't understand that. I just, I just, I, I can't comprehend that. Because he was on a different level. We allow our circumstances to get us to quit because our joy is so shallow. We don't get it deep rooted inside of our soul. We don't get it deep down inside of us. And if our circumstances are right, we just, we start yelling at God. Why me? Why this? Why now? We don't allow it to, to get embedded into us to where we realize today is just a day. There's another day coming. This is a building time for me. And what I need to be doing is presenting the gospel. Look what he says. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me actually serves to advance the gospel. He was looking at himself, and he gave himself to Christ. When he gave himself to Christ, he says, what is going on is this is an opportunity to share the gospel. As a result, it has become clear I get to preach to the guards they're tied to me. Hey, do you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? <laughs> He's, I'm out here. You hang on to him for a while. Hey, do you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? Let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> I'm out. Could you believe that? I'm using this as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Look at verse 14. And because of this, other people are bold enough to speak up. What you're going through, your suffering, might stimulate someone else to stay strong. What you're going through, your endurance, might prove your authenticity to your witness. What you're going through, the life you're living, may encourage someone else to tell someone else about Jesus Christ. Remember that every Christian life is a walk. The next thing you need to see is that living the gospel. We had a farmer back home that was also a preacher. Now, why would you do that to yourself? I don't understand that part, but you know, everybody's got their cross to bear, I guess. So if you can't find a cross, you build your own and become a farmer. And he was a farmer and he had an old gleaner combine. Now, why would you do that to yourself? Does anybody here own a gleaner? Okay, I got a smart church. All right. And, and an old gleaner combine, and, and this is the old style, and he was trying to combine beans and morning glories and, and all these old weeds. And, and we did this before you had Roundup. And the old thing would get all clogged in the front. Has anybody ever heard an old combine get clogged? Get choked up? Just, you know, and it would do that. And this old farmer would get down out of his combine and... <whistles> preacher, mind you. And he'd get out there and he'd get his knife out and his whatever. He'd jerk all that junk out and throw it to the side and... Get back in his combine and go to combine and get a little bit further down the road and blah, you know anybody, you know what I mean? All right, all right. And he'd get out there and he'd, he led his neighbor to the Lord by combining beans. And he said, "Well, we just watched you, and every time that would happen, you just get out and whistle. How come you whistled?" And the the preacher said, "Because if I didn't whistle, I'd been cussing." <laughs> But the way he lived his life, the way he responded to the situations and his circumstances that he found himself in, your circumstances may not change. But that doesn't mean that you can't have joy in this life. Joy is deep-rooted. Joy is deep down inside. And we need to embrace Paul's, embrace Paul's theology. Paul's theology is this. What does it matter? What does it matter? You're going to find a team that's going to be better, better than you. What does it matter? In the whole scheme of things, what does it matter? You're going to be turned down for the promotion. 
Sooner or later, you're going to get words that you don't want to hear. The doctor is going to come to you and tell you words that you don't want to hear. Sorry, we can't help you. What does it matter? He goes on to say this. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether I live or die. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is great gain. If I go on living, I'm going to go on preaching. What does it matter? I want you to take a minute and look at what you're allowing to steal your joy. What you're allowing to rob you of joy. What does it matter? We allow family problems and we allow circumstances in this life. And God says, I began a good work in your life. God is interested in you. God has big plans for your life. But we're stuck in this situation and we feel miserable in it. And we won't let God continue this because we're stuck in this muck and mire. And we're wallowing in it and we won't let God finish what he started. What does it matter? Paul was stuck in prison. Paul was an old man. Paul's facing certain death ahead of him. If I go on living, I'm going to go on preaching. But if I die, I'm going to die in such a way that I'm going to leave behind a legacy and let people behind me go ahead and keep preaching. I'm going to leave behind something. I'm going to live a life that is a history life, a a once-in-a-history life. A a once-in-a-history life. I said it backwards. You think, no. You may only get one chance. I'm enjoying the seniors this year, and I'm just watching from the background, enjoying watching the seniors, because I remember when I was a senior, I can remember, yeah, Moses drove our school bus, and Noah taught our history class, and I remember all that, but I remember how important each each thing was. The last home basketball game, the last homecoming, I remember all those things. The last MCT tournament. I remember all those things. They all are significant. But now I'm 40. My wife remembers years old. They don't matter anymore. What should have mattered back then didn't to me. What should have mattered was my walk with Jesus Christ, and that was what I was embarrassed about. That should have mattered. What is your cause? What is your confidence? What is your conviction? Because if you have cause, if you have confidence, and if you have conviction, you're going to have conflict. Are you willing to have the strength to face the conflict? Is your desire to worship God? Well, you don't do it alone. Unity. Unity. Don't embarrass the church. I put that down several times on my paper. Don't embarrass the church. My wife explains that to me when we go to a football game. Now, don't embarrass the church today. And, and I've, tr- oh, I've tried really hard not to say anything. I, I'm really hard. I'm, mm, and I yell buttercup at Brian every once in a while. Hey, buttercup! That's, that's, and don't take this. That's, when we started playing football, we used to yell at him and get mad. I'm mean, like, did you hear me yell today? No, Dad. I kind of ignore you now. So, but I used to yell, like, come on, buttercup! And the other one's pork chop. So he, he's not doing football next year. So next year he's going to run cross country. And we figured out if we can get him a hat and put some uh, Chick-fil-A on the front of it and a little Chick-fil-A sauce on the front of it, we think that we'll get him to run a little faster. So that's what, if somebody can build that for me. But don't embarrass the ministry. But here's something else. You're not in this alone. There is courage in unity. There's courage. You can stand up and speak because you know the church has your back. 
You're not doing this alone. Somebody else is going to stand there with you. And you know, I, of all the sports that we have, one of the ones that it took me a while to enjoy watching was girls volleyball. And the reason was they smiled all the time. They were enjoying it all the time. They would make a mistake and they'd go over there, that was mine. And they would smile and have a good time. Why are they having such a good time? I didn't understand it. But you know why? What did it matter? Did they play the hardest? They played really hard. They did, they did the best they could. And when the game was done, they, they did everything they could do and they, they went off. And, and they gave it their goal. And they were proud of themselves. And they worked as a team together. Unity. You're not in this alone. Listen to this. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. The word worthy is a word that means that you are balanced. Conduct yourselves in a manner that is balanced with the gospel, that you're in check with what the word of God says. Are you in check? The word balance means that you embrace what the Bible talks about. It means that you're not tolerating sin in your life. I like what John Wesley said. John Wesley said this, Give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care nothing whether they are preachers or just church members. They alone will shake the very gates of hell and set up the kingdom of God here on earth. So what are you concerned about? In your life, what would you say and how would you complete this? For me to live is what? Would you say for me to live is my kids? That your focus and your time is spent on taking care of your kids and you're running all over the place for your kids? For me to live as my kids and to die as what? Well, I'll be left out. Would you say for me to live as my job, my farm, my school? Or will you say for me to live as Christ? Is that what you're saying? For me to live as Christ. And when I die... Can you say you're living this life to hear the words, well done? Are you living this life that when you get done with this life, are you waiting for the applause of heaven that you went every mile as hard as you could, that you lived with joy knowing that God who started a work in you is going to finish it till completion? But in order for unity to happen, you've got to let people in. Unity can't be forced. You've got to let people in. In order for unity to happen, you've got to encourage others. Dennis McConaughey was our worship professor at St. Louis Christian College. The guy always had a smile on his face. First time I met him, he kind of, first few weeks, kind of drove me nuts. How are you doing today? That's great. How are you doing? You know, I think he'd got his arm cut off and he'd still be smiling. He's one of those kind of people. He's just always in a good mood. He had a program that we had to do for his class. I had to take vocal. That was one of the things you had to take at St. Louis Christian College. I had to take vocal class. I passed the class. Don't ask me how. But one of the programs, he gave us a sheet that we had to fill out, and every day we had to sign this sheet how we encouraged somebody that day. Every day you had to figure out how you encouraged somebody. You know what was amazing was when we first started this class for the first few weeks, we were realizing we weren't encouraging anybody. We weren't going out of our way to encourage anybody. It was all selfish. And so let me ask you, who have you encouraged this week? If we're going to have unity, if we're going to have joy, do you know what's amazing is just giving somebody a Snickers. Hey, glad to see you today. A pat on the back, a handshake. Hey, I'm praying for you. What have you done this week to encourage somebody else? Maybe we should have a list that we put together. You have a once in a history opportunity. To have pure joy. It's something that Satan can't take away from you if you plant it deep enough. But here's the thing. It's not based on your circumstances. It goes deeper than that. 
that game Friday night that <sighs> I just wanted to go home after 9 o'clock. And, and I don't, you know, I, I take gum with me because me and the refs, you know, I, I, you know and, and one thing was every time I turned around, there was another flag on the field, another flag on the field, another flag on the field. Knock that off. But I don't know what you did, but you did it. And I'm saying, I just want to go home. You ever notice how in a game in, you can get the momentum and they blow a whistle on you in basketball and it just, it just shuts you down or you get a tee or you get a flag in football and it just, it, the whole game is off because of one flag. You know, the other team, I, I felt bad. They had a great run and I'm like, wow, that, oh, that's embarrassing. Oh, there's a flag. Oh, that's really embarrassing. All the way back. I'm telling you this because in this life, Satan just wants to throw flags. Every time you make a mistake, every time you fail, that's all. He's just, he just sitting there going, hey, look what you did. Hey, look what you did. Hey, look what you did. And you can look at your life, and all you're going to see is the failures of this life, if you want to. Or you can say, Lord, man, I want joy. Give me my joy back. I want to enjoy the sunrise again. I want to enjoy life again. That means my life has to have purpose. And that purpose has to move beyond a nine to five job. That has to be a kingdom purpose. He who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. Have you allowed Jesus Christ to begin a good work in you? Have you accepted his terms and conditions for salvation? Maybe somewhere along the way you've kind of slid off track. It's invitation time. This is a time that you can give yourself to Jesus Christ. This is a time you can get back on track. This is a time that you can fill your joy juice jar. It's all up to you as we stand and sing.